Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's day three of our conversation. Hey, good morning. It's good to see you again, Penny. Um, interesting times. It is interesting for sure. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of facts about uh, Flipgrid. So right now we have 2,877 views of 81 videos. And I know that both you and I have experienced this with our classes where the number of videos that are posted is a fraction of the number of times people are watching or thinking and either not posting or going back to rewatch. It's just kind of an interesting thing. Flipgrid allows people to express what they're thinking and these have been powerful to listen to, but then it also allows others just to sit back and watch. Reminds me when we did book clubs between your school and my school, and the college in Ohio, how we had 130 kids in that bubble and those videos were viewed over 8,000 times. Yeah. So I know that I spent a little bit of time this morning watching some of them. Um, did anything strike you as you were watching the videos? Um, I started making a list and of things people were mentioning and talking about and um, two people have some mad skills on this Flipgrid. They had images of their notebooks and quotes on the screen. I was like, how do you do that? So always learning. Um, I loved how Sarah, she's from Portland, Oregon, which was like my heart beat a little bit because I'm from there. Um, will people hug when they meet at airports? And now what was another question she asked. And now what seems to be what this work is about, this like online sharing that we're doing. And then... I started making a collection of how teachers were being really reflective. Um, one person mentioned that she was noticing patterns in her work. And I just thought that is such an essential teaching move, right? That we notice patterns in our conferences with kids and that we notice patterns in what we're teaching, how we're teaching. Um, like if we call the writing process this thing and then every time the kids don't revise the way we want, but we don't pay attention to that, we aren't gonna change our teaching. So I just think there's, that's such a powerful phrase. Um, one teacher asked, how will we grow as teachers with this time to reflect? Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about that so much, like here's the opportunity. I'm, I think I told you, I was supposed to be in Oxford presenting at the World Literacy Summit, which of course is not happening, but yesterday they asked us to do all of our presentations online and we are all doing 12 minute TED Talks. So in the back of my notebook, I had my 12 minute TED Talk slides for my two presentations that I was gonna pretty much have down, memorized before I got there. And the idea of now having to do it um, in a live online kind of thing is a little intimidating, but at the same time, I, mean, I can bow out, but I love it when something scares me a little. So <laughs> I've been thinking about that, as you know. Um, how this question came up in several videos how do we help students view themselves as writers and build their confidence one mentioned that for the kids she teaches if it's not graded it's not valuable and i wrote right under that uh, we taught them that <laughs> right meaning the education world teachers um, let, me, they have let, me, let me respond to that because i often we often hear that that concern from teachers if my uh if i don't grade it my kids won't do it Mm -hmm. uh, and we've talked about how we do believe that kids have been conditioned to think that, but that in our classrooms, we almost think the opposite. If you don't grade it, kids will do more. Uh, and that is a little bit of a transition for both students and some teachers to think about. Um, and I know that I'm partially probably at fault on this because in the, one of our previous discussions, I talked about, you know, kind of mused about what's going to happen to grading, whether we're going to go to credit or no credit. And I noticed that some of the videos were also addressing that issue. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say, uh, you know, we can get into that. We're, we're going to talk about volume today. We can get into that. Uh, but I, I, I just want to say, given the developments, like I woke up to my governor in California saying it's more than likely school will not readjourn this year. And I think that's the way, you know, it's probably going to go nationwide, that the idea of grading right now is pretty low, or my concerns about grading are real, but they're pretty low right now on my, on, on my list of concerns about, you know, my kids. And, you know, what can we learn 
in this hiatus from school as usual about the practice of grading and the practice of evaluating. Because when you say, when we don't grade, um, it's sometimes misinterpreted as there is nothing connected to accountability with it. And the thing for me is, I always mention the standing at the baseline with a bucket of 150 balls I had to serve into the left court and my coach, it was about practice period. It wasn't about how many went in. Of course I was trying for that, but it was, you had to complete your practice. And so you and I both talk about notebooks as a practice place and you complete your practice. That's why we do checklists with, did you do it or didn't you do it? Is there evidence of revision in your quick writing or not? as a way for us to have kids practice. And because we lead them in the practice, we don't just assign it, mm -hmm. we model it and we show them how we revise. Our kids are in, we're also giving them really rich seeds to write next to. Well, in a million years ago, I used to coach high school basketball. You know, <laughs> we, got, we got graded every Friday night and it was printed in the paper every Saturday morning. But we didn't win or lose the game Friday night. We won or lost that game on the Monday practice, Tuesday practice, Wednesday practice. You know, it was getting in the gym and doing the work. Uh, I always felt that when we got to the game, it was just a question of, of sort of executing what we've been working on and what we've done. So, um, we, you know, it, it's, it's that day-to-day -day volume and, and practice that, of course, we know is really, really important. No, I just love how you say that. And I think that the other piece that's critically important for this group we're talking to is that the teacher has to practice writing. And you can't teach what you don't know intimately. And you can't continue to believe that because you once wrote in college, it's enough to lead writers now. And so a lot of teachers have commented that they're writing in a notebook and they're feeling good about it and that it's taking them places, it's kept them sane. Um, a calm space in a sea of storms, there's all kinds of things people are saying, but mm -hmm. to live in that for a while is going to teach us more mm. than a lot of the things that we think create good teachers because we have to be expert writers, as in expert in the process, not published, not, we have to really know what gets in our way, how we overcome fear of the page, how do we develop writing? It's so how, different. How do you outrun that fear and how do you get yeah. started? And, and, you know, it's not just notebook writing, but, it, you know, when we take seeds or quick writes out of our notebooks and actually now we're going to pick something that's going to be made public, uh, either to the teacher or to classmates or writing groups, uh, the t you know, when I ask my kids to do a larger writing task, when I myself do the large writing task, that tells me where the issues are in, in teaching that, right? Um, you know, it, it, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to write something that I've asked my kids to write and thought, ooh, uh, the act of doing it itself has, has made it visible to me. I, I need to go back in the classroom and talk about X because this is an issue with me as a writer. I think that's the difference between assigning writing and teaching writing. It is. And the very first piece I had published, thanks to editor Kylene Beers of Voices from the Middle, was called Writing Giants Columbine and the Queen of Route 16. And it was about discovering with my eighth graders that when I wrote fiction with them, I had no idea how to end my short story. And having that moment where you're just like, what have I been teaching? Right. How the things I'd said in conferences were not helpful to me right there in that moment. And that I had to step back and say, if you're going to get good at this leading writers, then you got to practice writing just like they do. So what, what have you been writing in your notebook? So today, um, I actually was about a half a page in and it was getting darker because I'm really worried about how far I am from my mom. She lives in Portland, Oregon and my aunt who are both elderly and that the very real possibility that they could get sick and I couldn't get home. Um, so I stopped and I forced myself to go to another place and I get a poem a day from like three different places in my email. And a poem came in called Driving to Work is a Spiritual Experience by this young woman. And she says, in any journey, there's an ecstasy to the pain of transition. 
when I was a full-time teacher, I lived on this edge. I'd be driving towards my students whom I hoped to assist in wielding the tools of language, metaphor, and expression. And yet I knew on some level how useless my attempts might be, were, when stacked against the very real facts of their lives. I was like, oh, we move in and out of our beliefs and those beliefs hold us to some sort of vision, she said. And then in her poem, um, she has all these beautiful images, but she says, when I get to school, one kid reads a piece about how he wants to give relationship advice for a living. He says that a cheater will always cheat. And of course, he wants to find a way to make us learn this. And I think so much about the writing workshops that you know I started in third grade all the way through that every time it shifted to kids writing honestly about what was most important to them and sharing that writing with each other, the writing process was an active, engaged thing. Mm -hmm. And when it was, we're writing for school, you need to learn how to do this to pass the SAT essay, or you need to, there was just a drop in energy. So I wrote about that, and then I listened to all those teachers on Flipgrid, and I started thinking about the connection because Annie shared more than one poem in a response to a teacher and in her own. And I, and it was Mary Oliver. Of course, I was like, where's my Mary Oliver stuff? And I'm pointing over here because it's on the right, left side of my library if you're looking out the window. And I took all of my poetry books out of my library, three and a half full shelves of poetry alone and reorganized them by color. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> and my whole family always goes, you can't find anything in there. I'm like, oh, but I like having to look. <laughs> so now they're all reorganized in color and they look lovely. But it also reminded me of all this poetry I haven't read in forever that's up there. So, so go to Jim Burke's Facebook page today and look at the picture of his library. Really? <laughs> It'll drive you crazy. <laughs> I might have to go help him reorganize. That is great. I got to... I gotta, uh, kill the sound. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, I started to write, um, you know, and this is an issue we have to think about as teachers a lot too, you know, is like when you write in front of your kids, how much are you going to share? Mm -hmm. You know, how much is, you know, I think there's a real benefit when you share real life stories with your kids. Mm -hmm. I know you've, you've written in front of kids about the issues you've had with your father's, uh, alcohol uh, addiction. I've written about my sister who had a drug addiction. Um, but also we recognize there are days we don't want to write in front of our kids or we turn off the, the camera so they can't see it. Uh, or there's certainly things in, in our lives that we choose not, of course, to share with our kids. But uh, the reason I say that is I wrote a little piece and this may be a little bit TMI, you know, as my friend that Yesterday, I went, I, I was kind of scary. I had to go into a medical facility because it's not a serious, but I had a, I had a piece of skin removed uh, from my ear and they had to decide for, for a low level uh, skin cancer. And they had to decide yesterday whether they're going to skin graft it and they didn't do it. But uh, I started writing about how weird it was to go into a medical facility where nobody was in there. Uh, they, I had to go through a screening process to even get in the building. It was just another reminder of how things are, are really difficult, uh, uh, a lot more difficult for, for people who are actually sick than, than for me, but, but about how life has changed a lot. And then like the other thing that you said, you know, it's, it's easy to go down the rabbit hole of darkness here, right? Um, and so in my notebook, I, I'm keeping one page I'm just calling Silver Linings. And so it kind of reminded me of that book. What was the name of the book you shared yesterday where he... he the uh, Book of Delights? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm just making uh, silver linings. You know, I didn't have to have the skin graft. I'm eating better because at my high school, and this, this will shock some of you out there, they actually stopped uh, the teacher cafeteria service. We, they don't feed the teachers at my high school anymore. So... Uh, there's a lot of DoorDash and bad food coming in daily. So I'm eating a lot better. You know, I got to, my wife and I are in season two of The Crown. So I'm just trying to come up with these ideas of, I love the crown. Um, you know, oh, being you know, so things that, that, you know, I feel good about and, and, you know, that it's not all gloom and doom. 
I was going to say, I visited your classroom, I don't know how many years ago, when you had your real classroom before you got moved, and you took me in the cafeteria, and uh, the food they used to serve you was not actually food. <laughs> my memory. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so um, you know, I say, go, go ahead. And I would just say, as an English teacher, and we touched upon this earlier, I think the biggest thing is um, that I am finding time to do a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, both professionally and personally, uh, that I haven't had time to do in the past, uh, because it's also part of my uh, silver linings list. I'm not in airports. I'm not going through TSA. I'm not, you know, uh, boarding. Um, and um, so, uh, and you mentioned Annie as one of our friends and participants in this. Um, this is the book that she she gave me when we were in New York ten days ago that I've been reading. It's called Leonard and Hungry Paul. Do you know this book, Penny? Uh -uh. Um, it's written by an Irish writer, uh, Ronan. Um, and um, I've just read the first uh, 30 pages, but it's taken me a long, long time to read the first 30 pages because the writing is so good. Mm -hmm. I'm intentionally going slow. And it's about these two guys. Um, uh, it's very British. It's very genteel but it's humorous and it's about these two guys that find each other in the world. Um, I don't really know where it's going to go because I'm not that deep into it. Let me read you, read you a little passage of describing Leonard as a kid. This is on the very first page. As sometimes happens with boys who prefer games to sports, Leonard had few friends, but lots of ideas. His mother understood with intuitive good sense that children like Leonard just need someone to listen to them. Hmm. They would set off to the shops discussing conger eels and have a deep conversation about Saturn's moons on the way back. They would talk about tidal waves at bath time and say goodnight with a quick chat about the man with the longest fingernails in the Guinness Book of World Records. But Leonard grew up at a time when quiet, imaginative children did not yet enjoy the presumption of innocence. His mother often found herself having to take his side against ornery teachers who complained that they found it impossible to get through to him. With patient maternal endurance, she would sit by herself at parent-teacher meetings, explaining that, like his late father, Leonard, quote, just lacked a eureka face. <laughs> that's good and, and, and every lot every page so far the first 30 pages there is a line that's just as good as that so annie if you're watching this one thank you so much um but that's what i'm that's my book talk today you want to talk about a book yeah i do but i want to say that i don't know how many people do this but my kids have done this for a gazillion years right what's on your next list the last page in a writer's notebook so i just put leonard and hungry paul on there um because i'm definitely going to want to read it so um windows on the world do you know this book i do not for people who are watching if you google windows on the world with the author's last name Paracoli. Um, and images, you're going to see images of all of these, which are um, in the inside cover sheet, it shows you all of the places in the world where authors sketched what's outside their window oh. and then wrote about um, where they write from. And the thing that I love is that you're going to not know 95% of the people in this book and places that, you know, will never travel. Um, and I just I want to give you a glimpse. This is Chimamande Ngozi Adichie, who we all love um, from The Danger of the Single Story. When my writing is not going well, there are two things I do in the hope of luring the words back. I read some pages of books I love or I watch the world. This is my view when I'm home in Nigeria in the port city of Lagos. And you can see, I want you to notice the panes of the glass as well. She says, an ordinary view with houses close together, cars crammed in corners, each compound with its own gate, little kiosks dotting the street. But it is a view choked with stories because it is full of people. I watch them and imagine their lives and invent their dreams. 
the stylish young woman who sells phone cards in a booth next door. And she goes on and on, all these examples. I strained to listen to their conversations. Once I saw two of the mechanics in a raging but brief fight. Once I saw a couple walk past holding hands, not at all a common sight. Once a young girl in a blue school uniform, hair neatly plated, looked up and saw me, a complete stranger, and said, good morning, Ma, curtsying in the traditional Yoruba way, and it filled me with gladness. The metal bars on the window, burglar proof as we call it, sometimes give the street the air of a puzzle, jagged pieces, waiting to be fit together to form a whole. Wow, what a rider. I know, and they're, they're just little glimpses like that. And um, I'm gonna link to this video. I did a post in 2013 for the Nerdy Book Club, and I had sketched what was out my window. This book is copyrighted 2014. It's so weird, weird to me because I thought, oh, that's where I got that idea, but I didn't. Um, I sketched my window. What do I see out my window? And then did a post a little bit about writing. And I just think that if you're looking for a way to bind kids together around a common idea, like sketch some view out one of your windows. And mm -hmm. what I wrote about in that post that I still believe in so strongly, I've talked to you about this, is that there is power in approximation because I can't sketch what's out my window. I'm not that good of an artist, but I can sketch an approximation of what I see and sketch an approximation of the drapes at the time that were in my study. And the idea that we, that writing is so deeply connected to the idea that art is always an approximation of something else, even if it's realism mm -hmm. and really particularly good realism, you know, John Singer Sargent, those people look like they live or Kennedy Wiley, as we saw last couple weeks ago, um, it's still an approximation. It's never going to be exact. And if we could let go of writing, always needing to meet some kind of standard or rubric or score, and know that it's approximation and that the love of writing is in the doing, not in what is written, but in the act of writing, in the um, engagement with thinking and creating um, is more important. I think we'd all be healthier and happier as teachers of writers. What an interesting idea as kids are gonna be primarily housebound, you yeah. know, and creating maybe like a classroom anthology. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing out your window? windows on your world right of course uh you, you've got to guess what this reminds me of hmm is it your <laughs> annual what i see out my airplane window or hotel window that you post yeah so about for about 10 15 years i've taken a photograph out of every single hotel window that i've been in and i don't sometimes i share those at the end of the year on facebook but um i don't know there's 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 a story like when I go back and look at those, you know, and sometimes the ugliest view are my favorite photos mm -hmm. sometimes. And sometimes, you know, there's majestic views or New York city views or mountain views, but, um, I don't so, know. Sort a couple of other things that. about notebooks. Um, Kelly, you mentioned that you have ordered a notebook. So it'll be your notebook on this, which I really think is just such a cool idea of having a notebook that could pass through the hands of the generations of okay. people that, you know, that is your story of this experience. And then you told me it's still not here. Yeah, uh, understandably, I think Amazon's a little behind, um, but it's supposed to arrive tomorrow night, but I have been cutting out, I showed you some yesterday, but I've been cutting out all kinds of things. I have a colleague of mine, Katrina Mundy. I haven't asked her for permission yet, so I'll be brief about this. She's writing her own poetry. Uh, and so I have cut some of that out you know, some of the news stories. Uh, I thought I'd never see this long as I live, an LA freeway at rush hour with nobody on it. Wow. You know? um, uh, yesterday, the governor said there may not be any more um, school. Uh, my friends are sending me photographs of the shelves of the grocery stores that are picked clean. So I'm just collecting all of these. And when I get that notebook this weekend, I think I'm going to I, I'm thinking chronologically, I'm gonna have a two page spread for each day as we work our way through this. And I'm just going to try to capture the history of this through my eyes. And then my, di my school district has asked us not to assign anything new this week to kids. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a transitional time for makeup and, and for what they call enrichment, which I don't really understand because I wouldn't do anything in class that I didn't think was enrichment. 
but um, and then next week my school has spring break. So when I come back in uh, 10 days from now, uh, I'm going to have this really modeled out for my kids. And then I'm going to suggest that this might be a writing. Uh, this might be the way they write about their lives and capture their history. So Kelly and I spent a lot of time together. <laughs> And readers wouldn't, or people watching this wouldn't know that you are the super organized one and I am fly by the seat of your pants girl um, about everything that absolutely drives you crazy. And I just thought it was so fascinating that you don't have a backup notebook ready to go because down here in the corner of my office, I have five. Um, I pulled one out this morning, like we, we both write in moleskins. Yeah. With the, and I pulled one out this morning because I've gotten to the point where this one has to be taped up because my pocket at the back keeps yeah. letting things out that I save in there. Right. One of the reasons I love the notebook. And I'm also down to the last probably 15, 20 pages. So it's yeah. about time to make that transition. I can't believe you don't have extras on hand, but I wanted- well, I live in a world in which Amazon brings it to you two days later. So I always just wait until there's about 20 pages to go and then I just order a new one. I know, but what happened is, because I was answering that question. You probably have way too much toilet paper too right now. Don't you? <laughs> Good, you can start selling it or sending it to all of us. Um, I have three or four down there and I know exactly why. And I actually went, I have a drawer in the seat in the window in my office where I have 90 notebooks because I go through them when I fill them. And I have them all the way back to one I kept when I was in middle school and was in love with Bobby Ventrella, which I wrote on every page. I love Bobby Ventrella. Um, and that um, drove me because um, this one, I got to Oregon, my father was having surgery, and I'll never know why, because I had been writing then 2008, forever. I left my notebook at home and was like, I'm not gonna have time to write, we're gonna get him to the hospital. And then I got there, and it was like Sunday and he was going in the next morning and I was like the usual, I'm home. I, I have to do some writing to keep myself sane. And I drove up to Walgreens, which is about you know five blocks from their house and picked up this notebook and I wrote this in the front. Love the earth and sun and animals, despise riches, give alms and everyone, to everyone that asks. Stand up for the stupid and crazy, devote your income and labor to others and your very flesh shall be a great poem. It's Walt Whitman. I wrote it in the front and then my dad walked into the kitchen and I said, dad, this is you. And I read it to him and he was like, that is nice. That Monday morning, we went to the hospital. He never came home. Mm. Rest of this notebook is sitting in intensive care is like you were talking about. I have things glued in here. I have his obituary glued in here. Going to the golf course with my son the next day to play in honor of him. This notebook is the one I never open. And it sits there because I can't handle it. It's like so intense. But the idea that, you know, I was gluing in pictures of the family and my dad and my son golfing with them. And I was thinking in that moment, I got to say exactly what if I could have known it was the end, I would have said to him based on a practice of keeping notebooks. And then one other thing about notebooks. Somebody mentioned a podcast I did recently. This is that notebook. Not that recently, but here's what happened. My daughter turned 13. She and I had a very hard time communicating. <laughs> I was not being very mature. I was struggling with the fact that she didn't um, always want to spend time with me. And she was going through that transition that's essential for every kid. So I bought a notebook and covered it with pictures of her as a kid, of the, of the family. And then I started it with this quote. Um, Since I've been given a daughter, because Sarah Kay's amazing poem, Point B, if I should have a daughter. Since I've been given a daughter, one I hoped for, no, begged for, hoped against all possible disappointments in the universe for, I thought I would always know what to say to her, that I would be wise and kind and patient every moment, that I would never forget how precious each day we've been given truly is but that's not what comes out when I arrive home late, wet, tired, cranky, and she jumps off the couch, a joy in her eyes to see me, who can't possibly deserve that. And I feel unable to talk about my day, even though she asks nicely, and I crawl into bed. And I just, what happened is, I then laid that on her bed, and she would write back to me. So I have this back and forth between us for mm -hmm. years. When we couldn't, 
communicate. Um, I would write, she would write back. I would then put it back on her bed and at some point she'd give it back to me. And it's one of those treasures that you keep forever. Well, you are, it's written, you are communicating. You are written communication, <laughs> oral communication. But what an artifact you have, what a family artifact that you have created. And I know that you have a beautiful young new granddaughter and another one on the way. Um, those notebooks will be read by them someday. Mm. Um, and I just think that is really, you know, you've taken the, it took a pandemic for me to kind of think about capturing uh, my life through this lens. Um, and uh, that's inspiring. Maybe, you know, once we will be through this, right. Um, yeah. As my superintendent said in an email to all our teachers, I, I think it's a Maya Angelou quote every storm runs out of rain, right? And so- I love that. Once this rain has passed, you know, maybe this is another way of really uh, getting people, maybe this event will get people into notebooks and seeing the value of that and, and writing beyond that. Um, I don't know, and I'll be honest with you, hearing that for the first time, uh, as you know, my, my mother died in September um, how, how unbelievable it would be to go into her house and find something like that, you know, that chronicles what she was thinking when she raised me too, right? So, um, although some of that might be kind of painful <laughs> to read as well, but, uh, yeah, what a beautiful share. Uh, I know today we started with the intention of really talking about increasing, um, student volume, and I think we kind of touched around the edges of it, um, but I think as we're here uh, eclipsing the half hour mark, yeah, that maybe we'll weave that in uh, to tomorrow's discussion with our special guest. You want to you wanna preview? Uh, no, I think you should. Okay, so um, tomorrow uh, we're going to be joined by a third teacher. Uh, our, our good buddy Donna Santman is a middle school teacher in New York City. Some of you know that six years ago, I, um, I took a leave of absence in Anaheim and I taught in New York City uh, for a year. And this is where I met Donna and we formed a, a, a really good, uh, not only professional relationship, but personal friendship as well. And I've always said of the two teachers that I interact with regularly, Penny Kittle and Donna Santman are the two smartest teachers I know. Uh, who are still in the classroom. And so uh, I know that both Penny and, and I have visited Donna's classroom recently uh, in New York City, and we are absolutely uh, blown away by some of her thinking on keeping writer's notebooks. And so we're going to invite Donna into this conversation. And if we're smart enough, we'll sit back and let her do a lot of the talking and have her share. She's a brilliant teacher. And so look for that uh, tomorrow. It, it's going to be great. And then Maybe you should let them know who we're going to talk to um, Friday and possibly Monday. Yeah, on Friday, um, Chris Crutcher's coming on. And Chris not only is an incredible young adult novelist, but he, um, as a child therapist, especially adolescent therapist um, for decades, has accumulated this whole deep understanding of how you help kids through trauma. And I just felt like it'd be a really good time for teachers to sit back and think a little bit. Um, this is traumatic for many, this upheaval um, in the world. And I think particularly of adolescents on the edge of so much um, in their lives. And I think it'll be really interesting just to hear what Chris has to say about that. And then on Monday, a special guest um, to talk to us about coordinating independent reading with your librarian. But I don't want to say anything more until I've confirmed for sure that she can come on. But the other thing is, I have one coming next week. I reached out on Twitter and begged um, Portia Ole Iwola to come on with us since I was using that little bit of her poetry. And she wrote back, she's Boston's Poet Laureate. She said she will join us. So next week at some point, we get to hear from her, which is amazing. That's gonna be great. Yeah. All right, so as I say to my students, stay strong. Uh, every storm will eventually run out of rain and hopefully us meeting together uh, helps alleviate a little bit of that. I know it helps alleviate it for me. Mm.
Thank you, Kelly. Thanks to all of you guys. Bye. We'll see Bye. you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.